Shalom, you're watching Israeli News Live and we have a very special guest today, a treat for you, very beautiful lady, former congresswoman of the state of Georgia, Ms. Cynthia McKinney. Welcome, Cynthia. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and I just want you to know that I'm a regular viewer of your show too, so, so I was to get the invitation to come on. Yes, and where are you right now? Because you are somewhere not in America. That's right. I am now in Bangladesh. I'm teaching at a university here, and um, I'm very happy. I teach undergrads. I teach them political science. Mm -hmm. But then the graduate students, I take advantage of the PhD that I'm still paying for in student loans. <laughs> And um, <laughs> and uh, I teach them in the business school, in the MBA program. Yes, yeah, so well, Miss Cynthia McKinney have told American people the truth about APAC controlling congressmen in the United States. And for those of you who don't know what APAC stands for, I want to read you a little bit from Wikipedia. That's a good start, right? But APAC stands for American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Now, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee is a lobbying group that advocates pro-Israel policies to the Congress and executive branch of the United States. The current president of APAC is Lillian Pincus, one of the several pro-Israel lobbying organizations in the United States, APAC states that it has more than 100,000 members, 17 regional offices, and a vast pool of donors. Congressman Brett Sherman of California has called APAC the single most important organization in promoting the U.S.-Israel alliance. Its critics have stated it acts as an agent of the Israeli government with a stranglehold on the United States Congress with its power and influence. The group has been accused of being strongly allied with the Likud Party of Israel and the Republican Party in the United States. So, Congresswoman, do you agree with the critics of APAC? Please tell us what happened to you. <laughs> well, um, I guess you could say I do agree with the critics. Um, what happened to me is, uh, you know, it was not by design, at least by, by my design. Um, basically, my undergraduate degree is in international relations. My graduate degree is in international relations. And so um, <clears throat> I had entered into the Ph.D. program at my alma mater now the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. And so uh, I was. it was a natural for me to serve on the House International Relations Committee, which I requested. Well, the interesting thing about Congress is that the committees are divided up sort of like in the hierarchy by that's a money committee or that's not a money committee. So international uh, relations is not a money committee or foreign affairs now uh, is not a, was not at that time and probably still isn't a money committee money committees are those committees whose interests are prone to give nice big pack checks so that you have less difficulty getting reelected so a money committee would be for example banking because the banks are interested in the outcomes of the banking committee. Ways and means, because every corporation is interested in uh, taxation policy. And so it's in the Ways and Means Committee that you can get your tax breaks. And so it goes energy, uh, energy committee is a money committee because, of course, that's where your oil and gas interests are, your uh, your uh, nuclear interests are, etc., etc., etc. International relations is not a money committee, right? 
because it's basically about U.S. foreign policy. But because I had studied U.S. foreign policy and international relations, the relations between states and among states and non-state actors, this was something that was very interesting to me. And of course, I had a very uh, strongly held belief that U.S. foreign policy should be based on, on the protection of human rights. And so, therefore, my motivation was different and the output that I wanted to achieve on that committee was different. Well, it didn't turn out to be so <laughs> because in the end, I ended up getting kicked off the committee because my values were not in alignment with the values in Congress of the powers that be. And so on it went for me. Well, you know, uh, Congresswoman McKinney, the one thing that really strikes my heart is, and the reason why I went researching to see, uh, as far as in Congress or the Senate, anybody in the past, what they stood for, uh, especially, and I was already researching before Congress passed this new legislation just recently about the anti-Semitic bill. And of course, I'd already found you already, and I'd been seeing some of your very strong criticism for the pro-Israel lobby in, in Congress. And then this bill suddenly catches everybody off guard. Congress also all of a sudden passes an anti-Semitic bill, which basically silences everything that you could possibly think about. If we want to talk about the Twin Towers going down and you want to say that, uh, well, look at all the evidence that points to different Israeli-owned companies uh, that were involved, that's anti-Semitic. If you want to discuss, in your case, APAC that you did, and I watched your interview on television there about it, uh, that would be considered anti-Semitic, especially if the Senate passes this bill and then the president signs it, which we know he'll do it anyway. I'm just blown away. And so I think what we need for our viewers to really see as well is that you have witnessed firsthand the strength and the power of one group, one one major, the most influential lobbyist group in, in the United <coughs> States of America. And the sad thing is, this is, this is uh, reflecting on our civil liberties here in the United States, as well as it is taking away uh, freedom of speech for the people. It is taking away, uh, or, we're, or we're making policy decisions based on another nation, you know? And, and just something is not right here. Well, you're right that something is not right. There's a whole lot that's not right. And <clears throat> I guess if we take a look at, well, I, I guess maybe it'll be easier if I just talk about my own experience. My own experience, what happened to me? Okay, so in 1992, it was dubbed the year of the woman. And so um, I decided to run for Congress. And it, in so doing, basically I was uh, expressing my uh, my anticipation for the positive future that I would be able to craft and create for my own community. And so uh, I wanted, I live in Stone Mountain, Georgia. I wanted to make Stone Mountain better. I wanted to make Georgia better. I wanted to, to sort of represent the more positive interests of the global community and use the power of Congress for peace instead of for warmongering. And all of yes. those things is exactly what I wanted to do with my tenure in the Congress. Well, it didn't work out that way. And it didn't work out that way because to make the shorthand um, <clears throat> characterization, basically what I discovered is that I have to love Tel Aviv before I'm allowed to love Stone Mountain, Georgia. That was the quandary within which I was put. And how did that happen? It happened because 
I was not able to raise money on my own. I had made certain friendships, but those friendships were not appreciated. There was a line that was told that I was expected to tow. And to step outside of that by questioning legislation, by actually reading the legislation and saying, okay, how does this affect, I have this, this is the standard that I would use. How does this affect my next door neighbor? How does this affect my neighborhood? How does this affect my community? And so then you're looking at how public policy initiatives affect at the local level and at the national or even the international level, because of course I'm, in, I'm interested in the international level. And so you uh, consider legislation and you debate and pass and vote on legislation based on the impact that it has on your community. That's the way the U.S. Congress is supposed to behave. No, it doesn't work that way. So, for example, you say, okay, I'm sick and tired of the wars. I, I, I don't want the United States to spend its treasure in uh, coin or in children to fight and kill other people. I just don't want that. Okay, so then you say, okay, I'm going to have an anti-war posture. You're not allowed to have an anti-war posture because these wars that we are, the United States is engaged in now, and there's no accident. <clears throat> what are the countries that the U.S. is bombing right now, U.S. bombs? Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Somalia, Yemen. Uh, why is the U.S. bombing these countries, these particular countries? It has nothing to do with making the life of my next door neighbor better. It has nothing to do with making the life of my mother better or making any of my constituents better. This was the way that I approached all of these wars. I was not allowed to approach them in any kind of logical kind of way because war is in the interest of the special interest. And so um, I'm not allowed to say, to question or to say anything counter. Now, how does APAC actually work, which is something that I'm sure that you're interested in? Yes. Well, basically what happens is that you've got a group of very, very powerful individuals, and they're all associated as a, a result of membership, common membership in a single organization. Now, what happens, though, is that these individuals step outside of that common organization, and then they lead or become uh, money the, the moneyed interest in other organizations. Now, these other organizations spawn yet more organizations. So you've got the uh, secondary and tertiary organizational structure in place that allows for the finance and the control of certain levels of policy. So this is basically what's happening. So, um, now, these individuals are able to recycle dollars, they're able to raise a lot of money, and they're able to control the narrative in their particular uh, area. So, for example, in um, um, uh, Gus Savage writes about this particular aspect, when, uh, spoke about it when he went to the floor of the House. Gus Savage is a former member of Congress. He's now dead, but at the time, this was 1990, he had been targeted by APAC, and he's a member of Congress from Chicago. So he chronicled his experience on the floor of the House. The name of his speech is laying out the facts, and I have a copy of his speech on my website. But even more than that, it's in the congressional record for the rest of the life of the United States Congress 
Gus Savage's remarks <clears throat> about how he was targeted by APAC and the methodology that was used to eventually unseat him, he gives it all away. So basically, you've got this organization and it its leading members create other organizations. Say, for example, the New Jersey Garden Club. And the New Jersey Garden Club then raises money and disperses this money, dispenses this money to opponents of Gus Savage. And so this is the way you have not just one organization that opposes you and your uh, policy position, but you end up having a tsunami of organizations with all with their financial wherewithal that are able to just drown you. And that's what happened to me when I was targeted by APAC. And that is also what happened to Gus Savage and he talked about it. It also is what happened to Paul Finley. Paul Finley wrote a book about his experience. And then it's also what happened to James Trafficant. James Trafficant had the same thing happen to him, where this entire tsunami just comes down over you and you're drowned. So now, what are the tentacles of the uh, animal that has been created by this process? Well, those tentacles reach into Wall Street, they reach into banking, they reach into um, uh, media is what I'm trying to remember. <laughs> so then not only do you have this problem of, uh, you have the media coming down on you so hard as well. So all, it, it's, it's all of it sort of, uh, Connected. uh, comes together to make it very difficult. And uh, this is the phenomenon that Gus Savage described. This was basically what happened to me two times, happened to me twice, that uh, I was not able to withstand the tsunami. And this is how they do it. So it's not just APEC. It's everything that's spawned by APEC. But you, you were mentioning New Jersey Garden Garden Organization? So these individuals that are uh, sort of uh, the main organization would be APAC, but then they created these additional outside organizations. So are these outside Those, organizations fake? Like, because... Yes, they're are, fake. They're fake. Like they're how fake. about some woman or organ women organization in a Exactly. So for example, with me, my problem was that I'm anti war. I am pro environment, but I can't get anti war money because the anti war PAC money is tied to being pro Israel. Mm -hmm. I can't get the anti the, the, the pro-peace money, because the pro-peace packs are, tr are tied into the whole uh, APAC mega structure. So it's not APAC itself that's giving the money to the congressional candidates, but it's all of these other organizations that are created by this one particular entity. So that is the power of yes. APEC. So it's a fraud, basically. They create these fragile and these organizations. organizations, like when Gus Savage talks about the New Jersey Garden Club, it's fake. Yeah. It's fake, but it's a it is a, a a legal entity through which campaign monies are funneled to candidates that are identified as pro-Israel. Yeah, so, so we see, I've, I've uh, and seen those that. candidacies are even fake because in my case, Rahm Emanuel just goes down to Georgia and say, are you willing to vote, get, a, get a black man and say, would you vote? Would, would, you, would you run against her? And we'll make sure you have enough money. 
You know, I can tell you, Congresswoman McKinney, firsthand, uh, and of course I did not realize it at the time until I did the investigation later in my life, but uh, the time that they brought me in to covertly work with the CIA, uh, I knew a lot of politicians during that time. And it would be kind of interesting because there would be some, some of these congressmen or senators, we would visit their office, and next thing you know, the CIA is having private meetings about a certain individual that's not going to be around much longer. As I began to go and investigate later in life, because I knew of certain people that were taken out, and I was always told these were Russian spies. Uh, but I was, of course, when I was in, I was young. I was back in uh, 1920 up to, to 26 years old. Uh, I had no idea, so I didn't listen to news much back then. But when I went back and looked at all these things back from 83 to 1990, I saw that systematic movement of cash that the news articles are reporting about, uh, the strange things that were going on with the power giants uh, in, in, the, in the southern part of the United States. Uh, you had uh, Georgia power, Alabama power, Mississippi power, Florida power, uh, or Gulf power that is, and they were involved. Uh, there was a lot of politicians that were involved that their records were being subpoenaed uh, for illegal campaign contributions. But it was George H.W. Bush in 1990 that put a stop to that investigation and made the power company just uh, plead guilty to uh, uh, racketeering and got them off the hook. But I can't tell you how many people that I know that lost their lives uh, and at the hand of CIA operatives working in the United States to silence these people. Uh, so I can only imagine like what you're talking about, maybe even more of these things as well that you guys know of. Uh, because it was always, like you said, it was a power structure. Structure Those old-timers, the elite that had been there, lifelong politicians, these were the ones that pulled the strings. And I knew about suitcases of money being passed. And, and of course, back then, they were arming the Contras down in Nicaragua. And I knew about those things as well. And, dr and bringing drugs into the United States, causing the, right. the, 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 the black community to get addicted to these things and I mean That's right. white people as well but black community in fact I can't tell you how many times that I knew and sat in secret meetings where they would discuss a crime that they were going it was it'd really be a crime is what it is but they would tell me no it's a Russian spy they got to take out this politician it's a Russian spy and then the next thing you know they would discuss how they're going to blame this on the black community or make it look like it was a crime like that and these being cases that have never been solved well, you know, um, the reason that I wanted to serve on the House International Relations Committee, now it's known as the Foreign Affairs Committee, was because I had this academic background, but I also had a personal interest. I had read the book um, uh, In Search of Enemies, and now, of course, I, I, I forget the name of the author, uh, which, oh my gosh, that's horrible for me <laughs> to have forgotten his name right now but what's, what's the name of the that book? book in search of enemies in search, in of, search of enemies let me look it and up. Sure. that book is a transforming it was transforming for me because basically he said that in it he, he wrote about why the united states was sponsoring these wars on the african continent and I was someone who, even in high school, I had decided that I wanted to learn the French language so that I could communicate easily with those um, from that leg from that colonial legacy on the African continent. You know, so I, I even in high, in high school, I took Russian literature. I guess they'll call me a Russian bot too now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I I studied Russian literature, and so I have always had this kind of international perspective or, I, or curiosity where I just wanted to know about the rest of the world. And, 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 and so this was a natural thing for me. But I will never forget that after I got kicked out the first time and then I came back into Congress and the fight then was for me to get my seniority back on the committees. So I asked for the International Relations Committee and um, uh, you know Nancy Pelosi is in charge. So then, what happens is 
everybody is saying, yeah, she won. She needs to get her seniority back. And she needs to serve on that committee. And this is the vibe that's going on in the room at the time. So then Wexler, you remember Wexler, Congressman Wexler from Florida? He stands up and he says, my constituents are 50% Jewish and they won't like it if she gets put back on the, in the International Relations Committee. And at that point, you could hear, I had all of my uh, campaign staffers, they were all, you know, had gone up to Washington with me because it was, a, it was a fabulous victory that we, you know, we weren't expected to win. We weren't supposed to win. And we were able to eke it out, 50% plus one. That was what my campaign manager said, that's all we want, 50% plus one. And that's exactly what we got was 50% plus one. And so we weren't supposed to win. We were able to get back up there. And so... This was like a huge, tremendous victory, and it was quite a defeat. Um, uh, Ariel Sharon came to Georgia after they defeated me the first time and um, came to Georgia, uh, was feted at the um, Georgia governor's mansion. The pr woman who defeated me was hosted. I mean, you know, this is a big thing that uh, I was able to win this campaign, this election. And so uh, basically then, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, doggone it, you could have heard a pin drop after Wexler stood up and spoke. Mm -hmm. And then one by one, when the vote was cast, when the vote was taken, all of those people who were cheering me on, those members of Congress, they became jellyfish and cowards mm -hmm. because then they just voted. And so I was not put back on the International Relations Committee. Ms. McKinney, this book you mentioned, In Search of Enemies, is a CIA story by John Stockwell. Yes. He, yes, John Stockwell. I think Steve knows John Stockwell, actually. Well, I don't know him personally. Personally, but, but John, yeah. John was working in the CIA as, a, as the operations director, right, and he went out right as I was coming in. Uh, so, yeah, and I know, but the thing is, is John worked in the operations in Nicaragua, which uh, I was uh, working uh, in a lot of the meetings over uh, Belize and also Mexico. Uh, but I can, I can attest to what he says to be true. The drug trafficking, the running the drugs, uh, they use, and they do this because they need cash to be able to fund the, the jihadists the rebel guerrilla fighters and stuff to where they have no paper trail, and that's the reason. Miss McKinney, yeah. I want to go back to your story and APAC, and can you tell us some specifics? Specifics. What did they want from you? What did you have to either sign or write a pledge or an exact specifics? What did they want? Well, I, I can tell you that what they want is absolute. 100% fealty to them. That's what they want. And uh, no deviation is permitted. In fact, the current Congresswoman, Nita Lowy, came up to me after it was all over because um, what happened, I, I had, there are these APEC sponsored pieces of legislation that are always pro Israel. And generally, they're the kind of thing that, you know, Israel goes and bombs Gaza. And so then there's a resolution in Congress saying, yay, we support Israel. And so I, I, I read every one of those resolutions and I would vote no. So Nita Lowy came up to me after my election was over and I had been uh, the election had been stolen the second time, I'll put it that way, not that I was defeated, but that the election was stolen the second time, and uh, I can get into that as well. Um, Nita Lowy came up to me and said, every vote has a consequence. Wow. Yes. So basically what happens, this 100% this loyalty that they want, so basically what happens is when you're a candidate, and this is what 
This is the distinction that I make to people who think that it only happens after you're sworn in. No, 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 no. You are owned by one of the tentacles of uh, APAC. You're owned before you get sworn in. This is the problem. So every candidate has to swear their loyalty to Israel. Now, so for example, you can be pro, you can be a woman, you can be pro-woman, um, and it'll be a woman's organization. You pro-environment, it's an environmental organization. You're pro-peace. Like I said, I, 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 I spoke out against George Herbert Walker Bush's bombing of Iraq. Mm -hmm. I have, I had, when I was running, solid, pro-peace, uh, anti-war credentials, but I couldn't get, I couldn't get an endorsement from the pro-peace organizations because I hadn't signed the pledge. What and was the, the pledge, pledge I'm talking oh. about is the APAC pledge. Whoops, the so APAC now pledge. what happened was I had this pledge and I had to sign the pledge. Okay, I refused to sign the pledge. And so then I had a family friend who uh, pleaded with the Jewish community on my behalf. And we actually even went to the home of a local um, uh, Jewish family. They hosted this, uh, it's supposed to have been a come to Jesus meeting, I guess you could say, uh, with a little pun intended. And, <laughs> And um, so we're having this 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 uh, meeting, and my friend, a family friend, been family friend long, long time, um, uh, says, treat her as if she's not your maid. She's not your household help. Allow her to think. This is what my friend, who's Jewish friend, family friend. Well, he lost the argument, and now and and then he dissociated completely from the McKinney family. Although we had been friends probably ten years before. Miss mm -hmm. mm. wow. McKinney, so, what, what is an APAC yeah. pledge? Can we know what is exact pledge? Like, what, what what do you pledge? Well, you pledge that Jerusalem is. And see, this is a long time ago. Now, of course, it's not a big deal because Trump has. Right. has uh, made it so. But then the Congress had also passed, the the, the law had been passed a uh, long time ago, but it was that Jerusalem was the capital city of Israel. But basically every president that would come in would uh, waive that provision. And uh, Trump just let it, let it stand. But that was the work of Congress before. Congress had voted for it and passed it. So Jerusalem is the capital city um, that the uh, military superiority of Israel would be ensured that the amount of aid that re was requested by Israel would that you would support giving Israel that amount of aid. There were a couple of other points on there as well. So now basically um, once I blew the whistle on the on the pledge thing, and I of course I just said it, and and I, I was outraged by it, but I was just having a conversation, you know, just a conversation with the sister girl, and we're talking, and and um, and I told her, and, and she was stunned, but this this was like common behavior and common knowledge. Everybody, if you wanted to get the money from all of these ancillary organizations that are controlled by the main personalities of APAC, then you had to get the money. You had to get you had to get on that 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 pledge. You had to sign that form. Okay. And it had the APAC letterhead. Okay. So then what they did after I blew the whistle, then they changed. And so now the current methodology is they will give a candidate the language and then the candidate has to publicly post that language or some variation thereof on their website. So it's a different kind of pledge, but it becomes the policy of the candidate. That's why you can get 
these apac sponsored bills that are nonsensical don't benefit anybody except israel and you get them and they pass 400 to nothing well when i was there they would pass 400 to two and the two would be me and ron paul so then ron paul was targeted by redistricting i was targeted by redistricting so you know dennis kucinich was targeted by redistricting they put him and marcy captor in the same district and made them have to run against each other so uh and uh actually um uh bob Barr. what bob Barr did that they didn't like was bob Barr said well whoa, 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 wait a minute you're you're proposing this is after september 11 you're proposing the patriot act but wait a minute that's a that that's unconstitutional yeah. and so bob Barr forced a sunset after five years on the patriot act they didn't like that so they targeted bob Barr and got rid of bob Barr. bob Barr came to me and he said i don't understand where all the money's coming from and i said you've been targeted that i can tell you exactly where the money is coming from and it's from these secondary tertiary uh organizations that are all uh tied into the same the, the same objectives well, you know, speaking about where the money comes from, <clears throat> I can share as well that when uh, the operation that I knew about where Bush covered, H.W. Bush covered it up in 1990, right after he became president, and closed the investigation, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Greg Palast, he wrote the, uh, the book, uh, The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, and he names, he's the only journalist I ever saw that got this, he got the story right, he assumed that uh, one particular uh, one particular uh, high CFO had been murdered. I agree with him. I think that his information is correct on that. But what was ironic was the very power companies that even uh, uh, Greg Plast was involved investigating. Uh, years later, when George's son ran for president, they gave him nearly, I think, a little over a half million in his campaign contribution. Uh, and of course, the other candidate from the same power company uh, structures there got a, such a small marginal amount of money in comparison. So it lets me know that, yeah, you know, th they put the money with the candidate they want to get elected. And if the guy gets that's right. without the money, so that's So now what a, happened you know, to me is that um at least the first time i was targeted i was targeted twice i i guess i have the distinction <laughs> the sole distinction of being the only member of congress who was targeted twice um by them because uh because of that comeback campaign so basically what happened was we were able to track the they targeted me and earl hilliard so um earl hilliard was the first african-american member of congress elected in alabama after since reconstruction so they went after what should have been icons in the black community they went after our icons i was the first woman from georgia first black woman so um they went after the icons and um uh basically also i should say by doing so they demonstrated that they could go after icons so every icon bows to them because they they know that they got cynthia and cynthia is loved I, I i mean loved in my district but when the tsunami comes it's very difficult to survive and the tsunami came to me twice well anyway so what we were able to discern is the mechanism by which the finance comes into the campaigns and this is very important because of the so-called campaign finance reform which left a hole big enough to drive a mac truck through the so-called mccain fine goal was well it was mccain fine goal but it was not campaign finance reform it was campaign finance deform because basically it facilitated the mechanism by which APAC is able to direct those funds. So basically you can have 10 men sitting at a table and they can divide 10 
multimillionaire, now you got billionaires, men sitting at a table, they can divide up the country and they can take certain congressional uh, races and uh, they can control the outcome of every one of them, those men. And this is all perfectly legal and it's mass. So and actually it was my mom because my mom, my mom was, you know, she's the sort of like the ethics, the ethical person. She makes sure, like I tell you, she's a Southern, genteel Southern lady, right? You know, so her daughter is not going to do anything unethical ever. And so, uh, so she would take those uh, FEC books and she would study those FEC books. I mean, you know, so she was the one that learned what McCain Feingold, the mechanism that it allowed. Wow. So basically what it allows is those 10 men can write a single check to the campaign in the name of 200 or 300 people. And those 200 and 300 people are the names that appear on the FEC report. But in actuality, they did not, they're not the donors of the camp, of the money. What a and corruption. so this is how you can get a, a, a few people. Now, what Debbie Stabenow told me was that it's a whole new set of players that um, control the money when you're running for the U.S. Senate. A whole new set of players. So at the House level, it's probably a group of millionaires who are able to pump hundreds of thousands of dollars into a campaign and thereby thereby um, affect the outcome of that campaign. Probably at the Senate level, that's where the billionaire, and then of course we see it with the Adelson yes. and the Heinz Saban and, you know, um, each side has its each political party has its billionaire class that is writing the checks and uh, but the interest is the same. So that's how you get it no matter whether it's a Democrat or Republican it really doesn't matter when it comes to Israel um, in order to qualify you have to have the policy position correct you get the money, you win the election then, so you're bought off, or you are um, controlled, I should say, uh, when you're a candidate. And so the rest is just gravy after you get elected. You know, Miss McKinney, it, it is amazing. Listen to this. It's horrible to even listen to this because you know how they are saying that Russia controls the United States elections and. To me, when you speaking, we have one foreign power controlling United States, and it's Israel. It's yeah. it's and nobody talks about this on the TV and, and the CNN or Fox even. They don't. Well, yeah, even speak. even they they are the CNN and Fox. It doesn't matter which mainstream media. All you got to do, like if I go down the road and I want to hear everything that I want to just hear is I want to be Republican. I know to tune in to Fox. Yeah. If I want to hear everything that's going to be Democrat, I tune turn tune in to CNN. Yeah. You know, but the right. thing is, at the end of the day, because I've worked in behind the scenes and I know the Democrats and the Republicans are, are, are very close and, and they're in bed together with all the, the crimes. But occasionally you get a good politician in, someone that is really willing to tell the truth, but they don't get to stay because of it. Yeah, well, and you can see here's example, one of those. That's right. with Miss McKinney, because here we have a fantastic lady who went to the politics to help American people, serve American people, serve her state with all of her heart, clean heart. And here she has found out that one foreign power, which is unconstitutional, one foreign power gives her such hard and difficult time and controls congressmen. This is absolutely awful. Miss McKinney, what can we do about this? Is there anything we can do, or is it already so far in depth in that there is like, what's going to happen to the United States and American people? Well, it's definitely not America first, as Trump puts it. 
I will say no, that. No, it's Israel and, and you know, Let me just say one thing, and, and, and for the sake of uh, the viewers that, that love Israel, I mean, I'm Jewish. I was born that way. I love Israel as well. But, you know, I am an American citizen, mm -hmm. and uh, I am not against uh, helping a nation that's in need. But in that case, why didn't we help Syria? Why didn't Israel, when they saw ISIS attacking and trying to destroy the Syrian people, this is the mothers, the matriarchs of our, of our people, why didn't Israel come to their aid? Why is it that when Iran is, is wanting a drink of water and they're being cut off because of the poppy fields in Afghanistan that we're trying to protect over there instead of uh, helping the people, why didn't Israel say, we've got the technology, look, we want to put an olive branch out to you as Iranian, uh, Iranian people and say, here's the technology, we're going to give it to you uh, and, and do like that. So if, 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 if things were more, more normal, I understand every country's got their lobbies in American politics, but this is yes. overkill. This, this is, is overkill and it's not yes. right. It's not, it's not giving the politicians that we elect to put into office, their hands are tied and you might elect them on what you believe to be good principles, but when their hands are tied by one particular government of the world that is not an American government, there's a major problem going on. Yes, and as, as uh, my, my father said, what does Stone Mountain have to do with Israel? That was the question that he asked after he witnessed me going through all of this. And then after I went through all of this, then I asked the question, I, I well, I make the statement that unfortunately the way the U.S. politics is structured today, I have to love Tel Aviv before I'm allowed to love Stone Mountain. That's how convoluted and messed up and upside down mm -hmm. the um, U.S. politics is now. And, you know, here's the thing. Nobody's saying that they hate uh, Israel. What we're saying is that we want to be able to love the U.S. Yes, <laughs> It's exactly. the country of my birth. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> we, we have our own constitution, yes. our own way of life, our own values that come before anything. Or anybody. That's right. So that's right. But you see, here's yeah. the thing. Um, Bibi Netanyahu's wife made the comment, "We're sophisticated Europeans." Mm -hmm. So you've got this group of Israelis who believe that they are not of the region. They are not of that soil, mm -hmm. although they're trying to use the soil to their advantage. But they're they wow. even in their own mindset are not of the soil. They are sophisticated Europeans. That's powerful. And so then said. that's why they are trying to join NATO. They want to join the European community. They want, instead of trying to make friends with the people of that soil, they're doing everything to destroy the people of that soil so that they can remain sophisticated Europeans. This is a mindset, this is an identity issue, I believe. Well, it is. Um, it since is. I, I did my master's on uh, nationalism and the idea of nation and, you know, sort of identity, the various identities that we hold, that maybe this, maybe this is the source of the problem. I don't know. Well, and you're, you're right. right. You're right. Let, let me say, because, yeah, because. Uh, uh, you know, Congresswoman, the thing is that what, what we saw is, especially in the history of Israel, the Sephardic community, it doesn't really, the, being Jewish or, or Israelite, I like to say Israelite because, it, you know, the nation for one shouldn't just be three tribes or, 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 or the house of Judah that, that we might say that came home. But when we had the Sephardic families that came back, my, my father's family is from Morocco uh, in Northern Africa. That where we migrated from, but then you have the Sephardic Jews that came back from Yemen, from from Iraq, all these different places here. This community was targeted, and it's been tried to be covered up in, in Israeli history. But uh, we have the case of the ringworm children, the very Chamish brought out, uh, and and all the different testimonies, the Yemenite children that went missing. Some two thousand children go missing, mm -hmm. and nobody knows where they go to. 
But it is, there is, and I've had intelligence operatives that I know in Israel that have written me, that have said with their own words, we are for a white Anglo-Saxon Ashkenazi race. Well, I see. The, the, this is a major issue to me because to me, you know, you have 12 tribes that have been scattered all around the world. You know, we have Jews that are Chinese, we have African Jews, we have, and I don't like to say, like I said, Israelites. So, you know, I don't know what tribe uh -huh. they would be from, but American, American Indian, every parts of the globe that we are, we're not just one form of European Jewry. Yeah, and Mr. Bibi Natanyahu, his real name is actually Mila Koski from Poland. So, yeah, when she said that they are Europeans, I know why she said that, because most of them are either from Russia or Poland, Eastern Europe. So, you know, I know what you're talking about, but also their hatred of Ethiopian Jews uh, in Israel. That's very concerning to us as well. Yes. Like they're not integrating Jewish people uh, you know, only the white Ashkenazis, which is a big concern for us. So, well, it's, it, it, you know, I happen to have been in the Israeli prison. So I saw um, the similarities, quite frankly, between the U.S. South during the days of Jim Crow and segregation and uh, Israel. So you've got the Ethiopian Jews that are there. And they basically were like the prison guards and that sort of thing. So they are the enforcers of the state, but not really the, um, how can I say, uh, they don't control the state. They have no right. control over the state. And in fact, those Ethiopian women were forced to take the Depo Provera shots. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Um, you know, and, and I was in prison with a, a lot of the Ethiopians who view Israel as the promised land because, you know, they're, they're um, uh, deeply religious. And, um, and, and so uh, I was born and raised, you know, very secular, but, um, uh, but anyways, they have this, this attachment. And so, but they were in prison because they were the wrong religion. <laughs> they were, you know, they were Christian, and so they were in prison and not recognized by the United Nations in any kind, uh, any kind of way because Israel doesn't recognize the UN. Right. Well, Miss uh, Cynthia, I want to ask you: Is there any solution? How do you foresee all this? I mean, I feel like United States is under invasion, <laughs> you know, like invasion of a foreign power. And what can we do as American people? I mean, we would like to have our own country back. So I am a naturalized American, but I love United States very much. I came here for freedom. I came here uh -huh. for opportunities. And yes. I don't want to lose this country. So you as a politician, uh, how do you foresee our future? What will happen? Can, can there be somehow resolved? Uh, I do believe that we can, but I'm not sure that we will win. Um, and uh, you're right, the United States is supposed to stand for something in the world. And the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, is something to which other countries aspire those who want to serve their people. And we're seeing the erosion of our own constitution yeah. inside the United States. And so I think we've got to get back to a love of the constitution, this love for freedom, this love for liberty. And um, so we can allow the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, to be the tie that binds all of us. It doesn't matter where we came from. If we believe in our fundamental freedom and our right to pursue our happiness as long as we're not hurting other people, mm -hmm. that's something special. Yes. yes. And so uh, if, we, if we can do that, then I believe we'll have a chance of winning. 
So now what does that actually operationally require? It requires you and me to not fall for the height and for us to not be divided. So uh, there are efforts through this divide and rule and manipulation and then the cultural hegemony of this, you know, of these mechanisms, Paolo Freire calls them the mechanisms of oppression, divide and rule, manipulation. And then, of course, you get the cultural violence that perpetuates this divide and rule and the manipulation. So we have to overcome this cultural violence that perpetuates the divide and rule and the manipulation. So now how do we do that? We do that by taking down the silos of division that have been built up. And so that means they win when men are fighting women and women are fighting men. Mm -hmm. So we cannot allow them to win. So we have to figure out ways to live with each other and love each other. Mm -hmm. As a black woman, I'm not supposed to talk to you because your skin is not black. So now we've got to tear that, that, tear that wall down. And in fact, it was Bobby Kennedy who said that each act for justice acts is like a tiny ripple that becomes a torrent that washes down the mightiest walls of oppression. So each one of these interactions is like making this ripple for justice. Because basically what we're after is justice. We want peace, we want to respect human dignity, we want respect for earth dignity. It's what we want. We want to be able to live with each other and love each other and respect each other. That's all. It's very simple. Yes. And so stepping outside of those divide and rule uh, divisions that have been made is what we must do. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second thing is that we have to be politically incorrect. So I might say the wrong language. I might say the wrong, you, you are Jews. I might say the wrong language because I, I used to have some Jewish friends, but they left me a long time ago. <laughs> I'm not accustomed to being around Jews. So I might have some questions, and those questions might, maybe my language might be right. But you can say, okay, I don't care about your language. I just want to know what's in your heart. There I want to go. figure out what's in your heart. I want you to be able to figure out what's in your heart. And then we are able to come together. Oh, man, that would be, that's my dream. Yeah. Yes. That's my dream. Yes. <laughs> Ms. McKinney, what do you think of congressmen who subject themselves to this? I mean, it's almost like they're traitors because why don't they think like you? And it's majority, of course, they're in Congress. They're passing bills and laws like anti-Semitic law, which I'm very angry about. Uh, and we had this video that we played for our people where a member of a Knesset came to democracy today, I think, and said that it's a trick. It's a trick they use, you know, so they shut you hmm. up so you cannot say anything. So what do you think of these congressmen? Because you're telling me that all of them had to sign a pledge. Are they American citizens? Do, do, what kind of values do they have? Well, I can tell you that's a good question because ultimately it boils down to our values. And after I went through all of the various tsunamis that have hit me. One of the things that I did was I uh, retreated and I went inside myself to understand exactly what my motivations were and what my values are so that I can align my behavior appropriately with my values. And what I've come up with for myself is, first of all, is truth. Because uh, I have this t-shirt from um, uh, Julian Assange, who says, if wars can be started by lies, peace can be started by truth. 
And so if we want to just get rid of all of the pretense and get down to the root of stuff, we have to deal with the truth. After truth, then we are able to deal with justice because a lot of the lies are constructed and erected so as to avoid justice, rendering justice to people. And then after justice, then we can have a durable peace. And after peace, when we're living together and we don't care about color, religion, we don't care about country, we just care about human to human contact, our souls, our souls are right. Then we arrive at dignity. So those are my four values. I just sort of figured this out for myself. And so um, now it, everybody and examine themselves and understand what their values are so that I come to you as a whole person. You come to me as a whole person and then that we can have a real relationship. It's kind of like marriage, right? Because if you're a damaged individual and you, you get married to another damaged individual, you're not going to have a very strong marriage. But if you're a, a, a full, whole, uh, independent in, uh, being and you are able to find a similar match, that's going to be a marriage made in heaven. That's the kind of marriage my mom and dad had, actually. <laughs> you know, they were married for 50 years. And, That's wonderful. Um, then my, my dad died. It's been a whole different world for me since since that wow. happened. Wow. Very sorry to hear that. So, well, Miss McKinney, yeah. we should it's, probably yeah, end it. It's been a pleasure to have you yes. on. Can you tell people how they can, because uh, you know, I know you have a website, if you could speak about your website where people could learn more about the things that uh, you have stood for in your past as well as your future uh, things that you're doing now? Well, I can be found at allthingscynthiamckinney.com. That's my website. And um, there's a chat function there. Usually it might take me a couple of days, but I always answer the people who go to the website on the chat, except my students, of course. I tell them, no, you communicate with me the proper way. <laughs> and um, then I'm very active. I, I, I'm in Facebook jail, by the way. Oh, wow. But my son <laughs> so was, was able to was. figure out a way to get me posting again on Facebook. So you can find me at Cynthia McKinney Official. Mm -hmm. on Facebook, and then I'm on Twitter as well. If the, if the president's on Twitter, then I got to be on Twitter, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I right. use Twitter to find out who got fired and who got hired in the administration. <laughs> That's right. And it's your birthday today. Happy oh, birthday. March 17th is my birthday. Yes. Well, happy Yay. birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed it, our listeners, and I hope it was a special treat, and I hope that that makes you understand more what is really happening in Congress and in United States politics. And See? demand more. Demand more of any politician. I would confront politicians because, listen, I'm not against Israel per se to begin with. I mean, I used to live there. I love the land. But the thing is, if truly, like the people that support President Trump, you say that, he campaigned on this America, make America great again. We're not making America great again by spending billions, not just on aid to Israel, but billions and probably trillions in wars to devastate the lives of humanity all across the globe. Do you not realize that that's going to come back to haunt us one day? Mm -hmm. It's a you collective reap, You guilt. reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones doing it. We, we put them in power. You know, but the people still have the ability to control that. I still believe that we have to some degree. So I think we should demand the politicians where their loyalty is. Is it to the American people first? And then if we need to help other nations, we should do so. You know, but we don't need to help them by giving them all kinds of bombs. Help them with the things that they really need. Build houses, build homes, quit tearing down homes. So anyway... Congresswoman McKinney, we thank you so much for being on, and it has been a pleasure to have you with us here today, and I trust that the viewers will really take it to heart the things that you've shared with us.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.